Good evening uh, and thank you for coming. This is our second uh, seminar this semester and basically it's uh, sponsored by the Californian of Regenerative uh, Science, the CERM. And tonight we are joined by Professor Philip Messersmith. Uh, he's sitting right next to me, uh, behind me. Um, Dr. Messersmith received his PhD in Material Sciences and engineering in 1993 from the University of Illinois at Urbana and conducted his postdoctoral research at Cornell University. Uh, Dr. Smith, Mr. Smith was a faculty member of the University of Illinois at Chicago and Northwestern University. And right now he is the, he is the class of 1941 professor in the departments of bioengineering and material sciences and engineering at UC, Dave, uh, at UC Berkeley, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Messersmith gave many, many seminars, um, over 300 seminars and received many awards. And so it is with my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Philip Messersmith. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, can you hear me? It's good? Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it is true that I've given a lot of um, guest lectures, but this is probably the closest one uh, I've ever had to go. I, it was just five minutes downhill on my bike, so uh, it was uh, very easy. And I'm <coughs> excuse me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I would like to tell you a little bit about the research we do in my lab. Um, I, uh, I guess what, what wasn't mentioned in the introduction is that my first degree uh, was in biological sciences and then engineering. And so I, I kind of see the world from that perspective, uh, from, from a mixture of, of bio biology and, and engineering or physical sciences. Uh, and, and so actually you'll see that in, in uh, the, the research that I'm about to tell you about. So the title, um, is something maybe you've never heard of, which are polyphenols, uh, biological polyphenols. Uh, it's a class, I'll tell you more in a minute, but it's a class of biomolecules. It's very widely distributed, meaning it's found in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, okay? But uh, in the animal kingdom, only actually in a, a few places. Um, and and, and uh, if you're, interested in chemistry, or maybe you're in a chemistry class, um, you, you might be interested in, in some of these molecules. Uh, this family of molecules, called the polyphenols, are biomolecules in nature that are rich in these functional groups that you see here. This is called a phenol, this is called resorcinol, that's called a catechol, and this is called a gallo, okay? Um, and and um, so the, this family of, of molecules is, is found in, in a variety of places. I'm going to focus my comments on uh, primarily muscles, um, uh, and then a little bit um, at the end of the talk, maybe the last third of this talk, will be on the subject of, of polyphenols that are found in tea and wine and, and uh, chocolate. Uh, at the bottom is shown um, a, a short summary of what we're interested in in my lab, which is to understand um, the uh, uh, chemical and, and physical behavior of these molecules in their natural setting, and then to develop um, novel functional materials uh, from what we learn about these molecules and their roles in, in nature. And some of the things that we'd like to do at the end of the day in terms of, of applications for our materials uh, are, are listed here. I sure don't have enough time to, to talk about all of these. I will focus my comments on surgical adhesives and, and uh, uh, coatings. So <clears throat> let's start with muscles and then we'll go to the plants later. Um, now, if, if you've ever had muscles in a restaurant, this is what you, you eat um, and you, this should look very familiar. Um, some people like them, some people don't. 
I actually don't. Um, uh, that it may, may have something to do with the, that I invest a lot of time in researching these animals. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is what you see in a restaurant. Uh, if you happen to be um, at the seashore, mostly rocky seashores, Northern California is a good example, um, you, you might encounter mussels on um, rocks, ship piers, other man-made structures. Um, and and uh, this is what you're likely to see, which is uh, a cluster of, of mussels. And, and it's not really very easy to tell when you look at this how they're uh, attached to the underlying rock. Um, so let me show you a better picture, um, which reveals actually the structure or tissue really that the muscle uses called to attach to a surface. It's called a muscle visit. So it's a series of, of uh, protein threads um, and these white circles that you see here on this uh, flat uh, uh, surface are actually glue proteins, glue pads, uh, not very different from any other glue. Well, they are different chemically from uh, man-made glues, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but they're uh, essentially these glue pads here link the threads. Uh, through the threads, they link the uh, muscle to the underlying substrate. Keep in mind that these organisms that live in the intertidal zone, which means they're subjected to a lot of forces of, of the movement of water, okay, particularly uh, as the tide comes in, co goes out, they experience a lot of turbulence, so they need to be anchored onto a surface in order to survive, okay? Uh, and this is the remarkable organ that the muscle uses to accomplish that. Everything that you see here is non-living tissue. There's no, there's no cells, no living cells in that tissue that you see. It's all extracellular matrix protein, so it's all protein. Um, it fabricated in a very elegant uh, process, which I would like to show you uh, now. Okay, in this video, what you're going to see is the formation, actually, of uh, one of these threads. Okay, um, and, and the process um, is very interesting from both the bio biology, chemistry, and engineering perspective, and I'll tell you why I, I, I say that in, in a minute after we watch the video. So this video um, was taken in my lab. We have an aquarium where we cultivate the mussels. And so we're taking a video of mussels inside of an aquarium. This is a mussel sitting on the bottom of the surface of the aquarium. It's fully submerged in water. And there's a plate of glass there. We're shooting this video through the, this plate of glass. And what the mussel is going to do is secrete one of those threads and glue itself onto the inner surface of the plate of glass. So the first part of this process is some exploration of the surface by the mussel. This is uh, what is called the muscle foot, which is the organ of the muscle that's responsible for secreting these protein threads. So it comes out from inside the shell, and then it is actually pressing against the inner surface of the glass in this area right here. Now what you can see in the video is in, inside of the muscle foot are storage uh, granules that store liquid protein. And when it's ready to attach, it secretes the protein directly onto the surface here. You see that white spot grow in size. And then in the, you can't see the groove, but it's also injecting liquid proteins into this groove. And in about two minutes, all of the, the, those liquid proteins solidify into a solid adhesive and thread. And at the end of that process, after it's solidified, uh, the muscle foot pulls away. So you can see the uh, pad here, the glue pad, and the thread. So start to finish, that takes about four minutes, okay? And um, it would not be unusual for muscle to secrete maybe 20, 30, 40 of these, depending on species, depending on time of year, um, et, et cetera, okay? Um, now, I'd like to make an analogy of what you just saw, which is uh, what we in, in material science call injection molding. It's basically the way that every plastic object Virtually every plastic object, um, including uh, this, this water bottle, uh, the, the lid for this water bottle, is made by injection molding, which is to say that um, you inject a liquid polymer into a mold, it solidifies, and then you release it from the mold. Okay? So everything, almost every plastic object you, you use in everyday life, plastic forks, knives, um, things like this, 
it, are made by some variation of that injection molding process. This is exactly what the muscle uh, is doing. It injection molds liquid proteins uh, to make that, that um, uh, thread. Okay, so it's a very elegant process. Underlying all of that is very interesting chemistry that I'm gonna uh, try to tell you about that in an accessible way. Uh, it's very complicated and actually we don't understand it fully. Okay, that's one, one message to start with, which is it's very complicated. Nature is very complicated. We're doing our best to try and understand how this works, um, but we don't understand everything. Uh, but I'll try and tell you uh, as much as, as we can. Oh, a second video. So imagine that sequence of threads happening many times over a period of, of uh, three to five hours or even days, okay? And then this video shows you that process. It's, gonna, uh, it's basically a video uh, frame capture of uh, every 30 seconds of a muscle secreting many of these threads. Um, and so it's the same situation. The muscle is on the inside of a plate of glass. We see the rubber bands here. It's just to, to keep the muscle on that surface before it starts uh, to secrete the, the thread. So it's gonna somehow be, be uh, held in place. Um, and uh, you're gonna see the muscle foot come out um, periodically and then secrete about four or five different threads in the lower right um, side of this, this uh, uh, video, okay? So again, each frame is every 30 seconds. So you see the muscle foot comes out, goes back in, looks around, touches the surface, doesn't like it over here, and then it secretes a thread there, likes it over here a lot more. So it's gonna do a couple more, there's three, and then, um, there's a couple more, that two, two more, okay? It made, made about five threads. Eventually it fell off of the, the, uh, uh, the rubber band, okay? Uh, so this is a very complex behavior, actually, for a very simple organism. It has some way of sensing the surface. When, it, when, when the muscle foot comes out, it, it actually touches the surface. And many times it'll touch a place and somehow make a decision Yes or no, is it going to secrete a thread there? And as, as, as often as it does, it, it doesn't. It does somehow senses that it doesn't like that, that particular area. Uh, so it's, it's very, very um, uh, interesting behavior. Okay, so um, this, this uh, secretion of the attachments, the bissel threads, um, is actually pretty unusual when you think about structural materials in nature. Um, let's say let's uh, let's start with the classic mineralized structural tissues in the human body, bones and teeth. Okay, how long do they take to form? Weeks, if not months, right? These very hard tissues, very very strong tissues, you know, uh, uh, bones and, and teeth, they take on the order of months, if not years, uh, to fully fabricate in, in 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 nature. Same thing with antlers, lobster shells, mollusk shells. Um, uh, wood, okay, really hard structural materials typically in nature take a long time um, to make, all right? At the other end of the, the uh, time scale here are some things that you'll probably be familiar with, which are also, I would, I would classify as structural tissues, okay, but which are fabricated by organisms in a very rapid process, sometimes a fraction of a second, sometimes a few seconds or a few minutes, okay? I showed you the muscle. It takes a couple minutes to secrete these, these threads, so it's, it's out in this range here. There's actually quite a few marine organisms out, uh, beyond the mussels that actually have to glue themselves onto surfaces or, or use glues in some way, um, and, and they are also uh, sort of in this range of a few minutes in terms of making a, a, a secreted uh, tissue. You're probably familiar with uh, spider silk. Spider silk is a structural tissue fabricated in, in a fraction of a section, uh, a, a second by extrusion from, from the, the tail of the uh, spider. There's some frog glues. Uh, you also know that, that blood clot, when you cut your finger, um, the blood clot that forms is actually a structural repair tissue, and it, and it forms very rapidly in a, in a matter of, of uh, well, the process may, may take longer than a few seconds, but um, it, it starts um, very rapidly. Um, and can, can be completed in, in uh, just a few uh, seconds or minutes, okay? 
So um, muscle and some of these other things are actually very unusual in terms of structural tissues which are secreted very rapidly and are immediately placed into service, meaning they, they have to be capable of supporting load, all right? So if, a, if actually a, a starfish, one of their favorite things to eat are muscles, okay? Starfish comes along and starts pulling on the muscle. Muscle can resist that only if it's well attached to, to the surface, okay? If it's not well attached, um, it's gonna be food for the uh, uh, starfish. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the outline of the rest of the talk is uh, shown here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know um, uh, for a molecule called DOPA, one of those polyphenols I showed on my first slide, um, and, and its role in, in muscle adhesion, and then uh, tell you about some, some applications uh, from what we learned from that process in medical adhesives and uh, in, in coatings. Okay, so... Um, the, the very um, brief summary of the next few slides is that these proteins that the muscles use to glue to surfaces have very unusual amino acid compositions. So those of you who are studying biochemistry and molecular biology, you know, proteins are made of amino acids. There's natural amino acids. And then some of these natural amino acids actually get uh, what we call uh, post-translationally modified. In other words, they're put into a protein and then an enzyme comes around and modifies the, these amino acids chemically. And in this structure of the muscle byssus, there's one of these very unusual post-translational modified amino acids, which is called DOPA. That DOPA stands for dihydroxy. There's two hydroxy groups here, dihydroxy phenylalanine. The origin of the amino acid is phenylalanine, um, and actually, uh, more specifically, tyrosine. So the uh, proteins are made with tyrosines, and then there's an enzyme not shown here that comes in and adds another hydroxyl group right there to make DOPA. DOPA is not found in any proteins in mammals, okay? And in high concentration, is actually only found in marine glue proteins. And right there, that gives us a clue that there's something unusual about this amino acid and something useful about this amino acid uh, for organisms that need to attach to wet surfaces. You may, uh, some of you, maybe most of you, have at some point in your life used uh, epoxy or some liquid glue, right? Uh, usually, they don't work well on, on wet surfaces, okay? And there's, there's many reasons for that. But the, the, the vast majority of man-made adhesives don't work well underwater. Yet the muscle has evolved this very special protein glue that does work well underwater, and it's largely responsible to the presence of this amino acid DOPA. Um, now, these two proteins, there's two proteins listed here, MFP5 and MFP3. These are um, amino acid, single letter amino acid designated uh, designation, so each letter there designates one of these amino acids. Um, so this protein here is about 70, 74 res, uh, amino acids long, not a huge protein, uh, but it contains 27% DOPA, very unusual. Uh, this is the highest concentration of DOPA known anywhere in, in nature in this particular protein. That protein in this structure here is found right at the interface. So it's part of the glue, an essential part of the glue that binds the muscle to whatever it's attached to, okay? There's other proteins that have various concentrations of DOPA. What does DOPA do? It has two roles. One is that it provides the adhesion at the interface, okay? And then the second is what we call cohesion, which is really more or less the, the, the um, elastic properties of this material uh, in the middle of the adhesive pad and also in the, in the thread, okay? Um, now, think of the muscle as a mechanical system, like the starfish example I gave you earlier. Starfish pulls on this muscle, okay? Um, it's a mechanical system that consists of the muscle, the shell, the soft tissue inside the shell, these threads, and then attached through this, these adhesive pads to the underlying substrate. So any weak link in that system, mechanical system, 
will make the muscle very vulnerable, okay? So this has to be strong, this has to be strong, and the interface with the substrate has to be strong. And this is where DOPA contributes strength to, to the system, okay? Um, let me tell you a little bit about the interface, just to, as, as an example of the kind of experiments we, we do in my lab. Uh, we're interested in understanding how much force necessary to pull one of these molecules off of a surface. We use, we use for this one of the classic techniques of nanotechnology, which is called the atomic force microscope, just abbreviated AFM here. Um, and so this is a cartoon, if you will, of, of the AFM experiment. This, by the way, this is a, we call a cantilever, is a very sharp tip. The tip of that um, cantilever is about 20 nanometers, okay? 10 to the minus nine meters uh, in, in, uh, in its uh, diameter, okay? It's very, very small. Um, and on the end of this cantilever is a single molecule, let's say dopa or tyrosine or some other molecule. And the experiment is very simple conceptually. Technically, it's very difficult, but conceptually, it's very simple. You put the molecule down on the surface and through this cantilever and the deflection of the cantilever, you measure how much force it takes to pull the molecule off the surface, okay? We measure the force, we make a histogram, which is a, a plot of the, the frequency uh, and distribution of, of the uh, force events, and then we get these histograms which tell us, um, the x-axis here tells us how much force to pull the molecule off the surface. There's some distribution of of uh, pull-off forces. The colors uh, in this plot here um, correspond to different forms of either tyrosine or dopa or a, in, uh, a oxidized form of dopa called a quinone. There's an equilibrium here, a chemical equilibrium between these two species. And it turns out, as you can see from the red and the blue histograms here, these two force distributions, this molecule here, dopa, is much stickier to our surface, has a higher pull-off force um, than this molecule or this molecule. So this tells us that the muscle is putting this unusual amino acid into the protein because it enhances the strength of the adhesion between the protein and the surface, okay? Um, and, and, and there's also, you know, more complex stories that involve covalent bonds. These are non-covalent interactions that we're measuring here. Uh, but the, the same amino acid can, can form covalent bonds with organic substrates, okay? So DOPA is a strong and versatile adhesive. It can bond well in the presence of water to both organic and inorganic surfaces um, through a variety of bonding mechanisms. Um, just a, a brief mention of something that is actually um, a hot topic of research in my field. Um, which is based upon an observation um, actually many years ago, back in 1981, um, somebody actually measured the metal concentration in the tissue. It doesn't seem like this would have much metal because there's no, there's no mineral in this tissue. It's, it's uh, nominally a soft tissue and all protein. But it turns out the muscle actually puts a lot of metal in, into the uh, tissue. Um, and in fact, if you measure the concentration of metal in the muscle byssus, um, things like iron or zinc or copper, it's about five times, five orders of magnitude, okay? Five orders of magnitude higher than the surrounding seawater. So the muscle is actually actively putting metal in for a reason, which, and that reason is it enhances the mechanical strength of the tissue. So they, there's actually a, a, a metal complex that forms uh, between the protein and the metal, which actually acts as a strengthening bond of the, of the tissue. So in addition to the, the interfacial role of the dopa, the dopa amino acid in these proteins actually binds the metal. And this metal bond with, with uh, iron and, and other metals is, is actually a, a strengthening interaction in, in the tissue. It enhances the strength of the tissue. So dopa has many roles here connected to mechanical strength, either of the, of the fibers or the adhesive pad or at the interface with whatever the muscle is uh, attaching to, okay? So that's just a, a, a very brief summary of what um, kind of experiments we do to try and learn about 
the role of DOPA in the native tissue. And then from those experiments, we hope to learn enough to um, allow us to then design synthetic materials that can hopefully capture the properties of the, of the native materials. So this is where I want to go with the rest of the talk, um, which is now applications of uh, this knowledge of, of uh, muscle adhesion in the area first of medical adhesives and then later in uh, multifunctional coding. So let me start this by saying that this transformation that I showed you in the first video of a liquid protein to a solid adhesive is a basic transformation in all liquid adhesives. So epoxies start out as liquids, they end as solids, cyanoacrylates, you know, super glues. Uh, they're liquids and then they rapidly solidify. This is a fundamental property of, of, of adhesives, okay? Uh, and the muscle has the same property. Transformation from a liquid to a solid takes the muscle, you know, like, like I said, a couple minutes to do this. Um, but we also need adhesives in the medical world for treatment, uh, uh, repair, and regeneration of tissue. So any situation where a surgeon wants to bond two tissues together or glue a medical device to a tissue, uh, these types of adhesives can be very, very useful, okay? Um, and, and, so, and, and also, in any situation in, in a clinic in, in repairing human tissue, Tissues are always wet. There's water everywhere on, in a tissue. So we feel like we can learn a lot from how nature solves wet adhesion problems and then exploit that information to develop better medical adhesives. Okay, so we can borrow actually the chemistry. I didn't describe the cross-linking chemistry really. Uh, it's, it's quite uh, complicated. Uh, the dopa amino acid in these proteins in the muscle uh, oxidizes and then they cross-link into a, a, a cross-linked um, uh, matrix. We borrow this chemistry, pure and simple. We can take that chemistry and borrow it um, and, and put it into a synthetic polymer and we can get the same transformation from a liquid to a solid and also get the same good adhesion between a, um, a medical glue and, and a tissue, okay? Um, this is what we would use in the clinic for this type of adhesive. Um, and this is a chemical structure of one of the polymers that is inspired by the muscle. So this is the, the middle part of this is a synthetic polymer, biocompatible polymer. And then what you see on the end of the, these four arms is a dopa-like um, chemical group. So this part of the molecule here is a lot like dopa and the rest is biocompatible. Take this together and we can make a liquid adhesive that when the surgeon presses on this, this device here, two fluids come together, they mix, and then it comes out as a liquid that gels or solidifies and glues tissues together you know, on, on a, just a few seconds or, uh, or tens of seconds time frame. okay? Um, we think about doing this for a variety of reasons. Uh, I just have time to tell you about one of these, which is what we're currently working on with collaborators at uh, UCSF, um, which is called fetal surgery. Um, this is actually a fairly new surgical discipline. Um, uh, fetal surgeons are usually pediatricians that do some sort of surgical procedure on the fetus in the second trimester in the womb. Okay. Um, you can see some of the things that uh, the procedures are that the uh, surgeons do. For example, neural tube de defects, um, spina bifida is one of these. It's very successfully performed by uh, fetal surgery. There's some other things that um, you've probably never heard of, um, but are, are very common um, uh, defects, which it can be corrected by surgery on the fetus in the womb. Here's the problem. To do that, any, to do any uh, inter intervention on the, on the fetus, any of these things or other things, you have to, you have to go into the, into the womb. You have to cut through the amniotic sac, which I'll refer to as the fetal membranes, okay? Um, and that's a very serious problem because that tissue, that the amniotic sac, does not heal. So if you make an incision or you poke a hole, okay, like is shown in the picture, this is the endoscopic, minimally invasive approach. Um, the place where you enter to do the surgery is a place where there's a weakness in the membrane. The membrane can rupture, and when that happens, 
it leads to um, uh, uh, premature labor. So the, the, the main problem associated with these procedures is a spontaneous rupture of the membrane uh, leading to premature labor, okay? Now, there's a lot of complications associated with premature labor. In these situations, it's even, even worse and more difficult, more challenging, because these procedures that are listed here are done in the second trimester. If you look at survival of a fetus uh, versus um, gestation at birth, so uh, a, a, a baby is born, at, for example, 22 weeks of gestation, that's the second trimester, um, it has a few percent chance of survival, even in the best hospital uh, circumstances. It rises rapidly. After about 26 weeks, um, it's above 80%. The shaded area here between week uh, 17 and, and 26 is shaded because this is the period of time when this surgery is done to correct the spina bifida defect, which means that if the invasive surgical procedure induces leakage of the, the fluid and leads to premature labor and the baby is born, it, has a, it is at very, very high risk, okay? Um, so these sort of events called premature rupture of membranes happen in about one to three percent of births, but represent over 30 percent of neonatal morbidity, okay? So it's a huge Huge challenge. And surgeons, to, just to get to the point I would like to make in the next few slides, surgeons have no adhesives, approved adhesives, to use to seal these defects. Also, the membranes are so thin, you can't, they can't really effectively suture the, the membranes. And even if they could, it, the suture doesn't create a hydrodynamic seal, okay? So, we developed um, these muscle-inspired glues. The picture, this is the same picture I showed a couple slides ago, um, to use in, in, in sealing these uh, fetal membrane defects. The, the series of pictures that you see on the upper right of this slide um, is a human fetal membrane. That's the pink tissue that you see here and also here. And uh, there's a three millimeter defect. That's the size of one of these fetal surgery trocars that they use to do the endoscopic surgery. So that's not a small hole, it's a pretty big hole actually. Um, and then the darker material here that you see adhered to the tissue and also bridging the defect here is this polymer adhesive that was applied as a liquid to the tissue using that device I showed in the picture. Um, and then it solidifies to seal off the, uh, the hole that's created by the, the surgery. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think I'm going to skip the video of, of um, burst. Uh, one of the important questions we have to ask is, does, does this seal well? Um, because the pressure in the, in the womb uh, is about 10 millimeters of mercury, which probably doesn't mean anything to you. Um, in the third trimester, is 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, the, this type of, of repair job here can hold up to 120 millimeters of mercury. So pretty, pretty strong uh, adhesion here. Um, and uh, let me just conclude this part by saying uh, where we have uh, been uh, recently is we've conducted our first in vivo study in rabbits. This was actually published um, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, here's the important data shown, shown in red, which is the, here's the experiment. You, you poke a hole in the fetal membrane. You either do nothing, which is the current um, uh, standard of care for human fetal surgery, Surgeons don't use any adhesive or, or sutures, okay? If you do this in rabbits, 36% uh, of the fetuses survive, the rest die. Um, if you poke a hole and then repair it with our muscle glue, this stuff here, we can increase to 60%. If you use muscle glue plus some sort of three-dimensional tissue um, sealant, um, we can get up to 80%. We're pretty happy about that. Um, the gold standard is called something called fiber and glue, um, and, and that really doesn't work very well. So we're fairly happy with this result, but, you know, rabbits are rabbits, and so we're, we're currently working on um, taking this to the next uh, uh, step, which will be large animals, and then hopefully eventually uh, into humans with our collaborators at, at UCSF. 
just as an uh, interesting side note, we also d developed these adhesives for, for other researchers to use. We, we were actually approached by a group at Caltech. They study the movement of jellyfish through, through the water, and they have a need to actually attach electrodes onto the bell of the jellyfish, and they couldn't get any, any uh, um, adhesives to work. So they came to us and said, you know, can you help us out? And, and so uh, this video shows the result of, of this same, same adhesive, actually, as, as in the medical glue. Um, but you can see this jellyfish. These two electrodes that you see right here are glued down with that, that medical adhesive that I showed you. Um, and, and so it's um, a pretty, pretty effective uh, sealant uh, applied to a wet tissue and stays on very well. Um, through the, through the uh, movement of the, the organism. Okay, so last um, subject are uh, coatings. And that probably sounds a bit strange. You don't think much about coatings, but many things in uh, everyday life have some form of coating, either for uh, appearance, um, uh, for protection, or some function. Many, many materials have, have coatings. So it's, it's in everyday life, even though you, you, you don't think much about this. Um, and it's always, a, um, uh, or not always, but is often difficult to attach coatings onto materials. Uh, and that might, might sound like a strange comment, but um, it's actually true that, that many materials are challenging to, to apply coatings uh, onto. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we also, borrow ideas from the muscle to use as uh, coatings, all right? Uh, so I want to give you one example of, of a very special coating we, we worked on about 10 years ago, borrowing ideas of the muscle, and then also the other classic adhesion model in nature, which is the gecko. You may have heard of, of geckos. They can, they can actually uh, they climb up walls across the ceiling and they, they, they do so by um, supporting the, the, the weight of the organism um, uh, on their, their foot pads, okay? Um, it, it only works well under dry circumstances, though. So dry adhesion, temporary adhesion, muscle is wet and permanent adhesion. So these two are very much at the opposite ends of the adhesion spectrum in, in nature. So temporary, permanent, Okay, in terms of proteins, so actually both organisms attach the surfaces using proteins. I told you about the muscle proteins, very unusual uh, in, in the protein composition. Geckos attach with very ordinary proteins. It's actually here, keratin. Okay, I'll show you in a minute. The, so the contact surface that the gecko uses to attach to, to um, uh, surfaces is actually a, a, a very dense array of hairs. And then, as I mentioned, Geckos only work under dry uh, uh, conditions. Muscles can accomplish wet adhesion, okay? So here's, um, here's some more detail about the gecko foot. So if you look closely at where the, what uh, is happening here on the gecko uh, foot pads, you actually see if you, as you go in higher and higher magnification, you actually see a very, that the surface is actually a dense array of hairs. The hairs are very, very fine, so this, this tip here of these hairs are, is on the order of 200 nanometers. So that's 500 times smaller than a human hair. Okay, so they're very, very fine here. And um, the interactions that give rise to adhesion for the organism are very weak interactions. If you're, if you're taking or are taking chemistry, you've learned about non-covalent interactions, secondary bonds like van der Waals interactions. The gecko takes advantage of, of uh, van der Waals interactions primarily to uh, achieve adhesion, okay? Now you can make synthetic gecko adhesives, things like tapes, um, um, by replicating this sort of structured surface. So you can make um, hairy surfaces using nanofabrication techniques. So a bunch of tapes like this. Um, but they typically only work under dry conditions like um, is, is the case with, with geckos. So actually, uh, about 10 years ago, um, we combined uh, muscle and gecko adhesion together 
to make a tape, a gecko mimetic tape that works well under dry conditions and wet conditions. And it's a very simple process. We uh, made a gecko mimetic tape out of a silicone rubber. And then on the surface of each of these uh, very stubby hairs, um, we applied a polymer, a synthetic polymer that was a mimic of the muscle adhesive proteins. Okay, you see the, the uh, phenolic um, uh, group here. So each of these uh, tips on this surface um, is coated with a wet adhesive polymer. So then when you put this tape down on the surface, it can adhere both in wet and uh, dry conditions. So here's some of the data. This is for adhesive force underwater. We increased by, increased by 15 fold the adhesion simply by putting that muscle inspired polymer onto this dry structured adhesive. And it works well to put it down on the surface, pull it off, put it back down many, many cycles, uh, hundreds if not thousands of cycles, you can do this. So it's kind of like a post-it, uh, except a post-it that would work both in dry and wet uh, conditions. Okay, so let me finish up with the last 10 minutes on <coughs> plant polyphenols, okay? And this is where things like uh, tea, chocolate, wine, uh, coffee, capers, uh, come in, uh, oddly enough, as inspiration for making uh, new materials. So um, again, the class of materials that um, are in common between the muscles and um, these things that you see here are polyphenols, okay? Now, in almost all plants, there are polyphenols, and they have a variety of, of functions. Some of them are listed here, chemical defense, Many of these compounds are in plant tissues because they provide antibacterial or antiviral properties to the tissue. Um, pigmentation, they provide coloration to tissues. They're also, in some cases, structural, so they provide structural support to plant tissues. Um, and then also, they, they uh, are very important in preventing radiation damage, okay? Um, but nowhere, in, in uh, the polyphenol, the plant world, do researchers talk about polyphenols in terms of adhesion, okay? So it's just not part of the conversation in the world of researchers where they look at these plant-derived uh, polyphenols, okay? But now I'm showing you the chemical structures. You don't have to be a chemist to look at these molecules and see that they're chemically very similar um, to the chemical structure of the dopa amino acid that I told you about, which is in the muscle adhesive proteins. So that's dopa right here. If you look at these molecules, so these molecules here, EG, uh, EGC, ECG, EGCG, pretty complicated molecules, but these are molecules that are found in green tea. These are the things they actually hear so much about that uh, are uh, supposed to be healthful, drink more green tea, you know, that, that kind of story, um, those are these molecules, okay? These, these are chemically very, very similar uh, to DOPA, okay? These are some other molecules. Tannic acid is found in oak trees, pyrogallol in plants, uh, marine plants. Resveratrol, you may have heard about resveratrol. That's the compound in red wine that is supposed to be a, um, a benefit, healthy benefit. It's also a polyphenol. Okay, and there's some other ones listed here. So chemically, they're very similar to DOPA, which means by analogy, they should be very adhesive to surfaces. So this is where I'm going uh, with this. Um, now, some of the things on this slide, I think everybody in the audience will have some uh, personal experience with. Uh, maybe if you're not old enough, uh, just wait for the second panel to come up. <laughs> um, but red wine, the so-called astringency effect. When you drink a glass of red wine, your mouth feels uh, somewhat dry at the end of the sip. That's called astringency. Now, the Latin root for astringency uh, is to bind. Okay? It tells you a little bit of something about the property of these molecules. They're very strong binders. Um, and, and so what happens in, in astringency? The, Salivary proteins, so these are proteins in your mouth. These are actually the proteins that lubricate your mouth. And, the, 
in the saliva. Um, the polyphenols from the wine, actually when you take a sip, the polyphenols interact so strongly with these proteins that they, were, they condense the proteins, okay? And, and if the proteins are removed or condensed, your mouth feels dry because you've lost the lubrication uh, uh, effect of the proteins. And this is an interfacial effect, okay? It's a binding effect. So that's example number one. Example number two uh, that you're familiar with is uh, called quinone tanning um, and also browning of, of fruits and vegetables. If you peel a banana and you wait an hour or you put a banana without peeling it into the refrigerator, that's a mechanical shock. Um, what happens to give it um, a brown color is this reaction, which involves oxidation of one of the polyphenols in the, in the banana um, uh, uh, peel, and it oxidizes, and then it reacts with proteins, and this is the same reaction, actually, that gives rise to leather uh, from uh, animal hide. Okay, it's the same sort of reaction. That's an interfacial reaction involving polyphenols. And then the final example is tea. So if you're familiar with the different types of tea, um, the, uh, the uh, green teas are not fermented, meaning they're not oxidized. Uh, so the polyphenols uh, look like the structures that I showed on the previous slide. Oolong tea is a little bit oxidized, so you get a darker color. And then black tea is more oxidized. So this is called so-called fermentation. Um, um, and when this happens, actually the molecules get, get uh, bound to the, the tea leaf, all right? Um, and so that's also another sort of interfacial, hidden interfacial property of, of polyphenols. You can actually convince yourself that these molecules in tea and wine are sticky um, in your kitchen, all right? So here's a simple kitchen experiment you can do. Take a, 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 a teacup, clean teacup, tea, uh, a clean uh, glass, brew a cup of tea, pour a, a glass of wine, wait, wait for a period of time, a couple hours, cover it so it doesn't evaporate, okay? And then pour out the contents and then rinse with tap water. And after you rinse, you really don't see anything. I mean, to your eye, you can't see it. But it turns out there's a very thin coating of these polyphenols that, that have stuck to the inner surface of, of the container, okay, on the inside here. You just can't see it because it's a very thin coating. Now, there is a way to visualize this, very simple way to do it, which is add silver nitrate, a solution, aqueous solution of silver nitrate. And if you do that, what happens is you get a redox reaction between the silver ions um, that forms metallic silver and it gets bound to the surface. And when you do this, you can, you can visualize the coating as a dark material um, because the silver, when it gets reduced, it has a yellow, dark, brown color. Uh, so on the teacup, you can see where the, the coating is uh, from the color. The tea bag is dark colored after this uh, silver trick. Um, and then, well, it's kind of hard to see here, but the inside of the, the wine glass here um, is slightly yellow from absorbed polyphenols from, from the wine. Okay, so the molecules stick to the surfaces of the containers. And this is, uh, of course, a very, um, uh, very strong evidence of adhesive, adhesive behavior. Okay, um, so what can we do with this? Anything interesting we can do with this? Yes, there turns out to be many things that we can do with this. Um, uh, so these are some of the compounds that actually prices, commodity prices, I wouldn't say commodity, uh, research grade uh, prices. Some of these compounds, like the native compounds in green tea, are very, very expensive. You would not want to uh, buy this uh, compound unless you were uh, independently wealthy. Um, but some of these other compounds are very, very inexpensive, pennies per gram, okay? And you can make coatings out of them by simply taking something you want to coat and dipping it into a solution of one of these compounds. Out comes a, a uh, substrate, whatever it is, that has a very thin coating. Sometimes they're colored, like this one here. Sometimes they're not colored, but you, it, there is a coating there. Um, and uh, you can do this with many of the, the biological polyphenols um, found in plants, okay? Um, these are, this is about almost 20 
plant-derived polyphenols. These are, can all be extracted from plant tissues. Everything you see here, extracted from plants. Um, the ones shown in red form these coatings. The ones who are shown in black do not. Okay, we're still trying to understand why some do, some don't. Okay, that's an ongoing um, uh, project. Um, but all of these compounds have biological activity. So we can take advantage of that in, in coatings. So there's a number of things we can do uh, by applying these coatings to solid substrates or um, particles, colloids, um, and then take advantage of their biological activity. I want to tell you uh, about just one, really, uh, because I'm running out of time, which is antibacterial activity. There's many situations um, in everyday life, also in medicine, where you want surfaces to be antibacterial so they don't, um, um, uh, uh, so bacteria don't grow and form biofilms on the surfaces. All medical devices would benefit actually from antibacterial coatings. And it turns out that these simple dip coatings of the uh, plant polyphenols are very antibacterial. So the bacteria seem to actually just die when they touch the surfaces. We don't understand yet what the mechanism is, okay? Um, but you can see in this, this plot on the left here, um, for five different bacterial species, both gram-negative, gram-positive, uh, when the bacteria encounter the coating, um, you get, in most cases, over 90% uh, killing of, of the bacteria. So they're very effective at, at uh, antibacterial uh, properties. Uh, I'm gonna skip through this in the interest of time. This is really the last slide before I um, make some acknowledgements. Uh, so these are the things we're inspired by. And again, the, th uh, the, the uh, chemical molecules that are, are uh, common among all these very different things are called polyphenols. They appear in both plant and, and animal tissues. Um, and to us, my group, um, we're interested in understanding how they function in nat nature, particularly their adhesive properties, uh, and then develop uh, uh, practical materials that hopefully can, can be very useful in a, in a, in a number of uh, settings. Um, so these are the people that actually do the work. Um, uh, and this is a, a more comprehensive list of, of uh, students and postdocs that have passed through my lab in the last 10 years some collaborators at other institutions. Uh, none of this is possible without um, funding. Um, so thank you to the taxpayers, uh, National Institutes of Health and, and NASA, uh, some other um, um, funding schemes from, from Europe. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I guess that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, thank you again for the invitation. And I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, the, the question was, how, how did I get interested in studying muscles? Um, <clears throat> so when I was a young professor, I read, uh, I was, uh, I, on a regular basis, I read the journal literature, academic journals, uh, just because I was interested in knowing what's going on. Uh, there's a good teaching moment here, which is you should be reading, um, uh, reading science, hopefully. And one of these times, actually, read a paper um, on, published on, on the subject of the muscle adhesive proteins. This is almost 20 years ago now. And at that point in time, almost uh, very little was known about these proteins. But I recognized an opportunity maybe to contribute something new to that field. And also as a material scientist, I, I realized that um, you know if we could understand those proteins, we might be able to develop synthetic materials to function as well as the proteins. So that's what, I, that's what I've been doing for 15 years. Yeah. So, so I have uh, two questions. They're both the same question. Um, okay. one, one is what, so you, you focus on the muscles, for example. And when it comes to uses, for, um, I, I want to ask um, for something like, um, so it might, seems like some of these clues might be good for sealing cracked teeth or something like that. 
um, which is a difficult problem. For, for the, there's no treatment as far as I know for that sort of thing now. Um, and also, you know, more speculatively, uh, I, I, I read um, sometimes that they're talking about putting computer chips in people's brain, computer chips in people's brains and things like that. And I, I would wonder how those things would get attached. So I just wonder also in your lab and people that do work like you do, what, what drives your imagination to work on the, the, the topics that you do work on? Right, so, so uh, it's interesting you, you mentioned um, dental and craniofacial applications. Actually, um, there are many uh, situations where um, a dentist or an oral surgeon um, is really in need of, of adhesive. Um, materials. So most of, of restorative dentistry, most of the reasons you go to a dentist is actually to, to repair or restore the tissue with things like composites and stuff like that. And adhesion is always an important aspect of, of, of those um, uh, treatments because you have to adhere to the, the existing tissues. And, and it, it turns out that about Half of the grants that you see lift, listed here are from the Dental Institute at NIH. So they are interested in this. I, I will tell you, um, keep this a secret though, um, uh, it, there's a problem with, with the use of these compounds in dentistry, which is, um, you may have noticed that they, they're dark colored. <laughs> so no, nobody wants brown teeth, I don't, I don't think. Um, and, and so there's some issues with respect to um, the cosmetic appearance of these materials. They could be useful in, in the back part of the, the mouth where appearance is, and color is not so important. Um, but your, your other example of, of um, gluing electrodes, for example, we've, we've worked with some neurosurgeons, done preliminary experiments on, I think, two, two primates. Um, yeah, this is back in, at Northwestern uh, a few years ago. And uh, they had the problem where they had an array of electrodes. I think it was a, a 16 by 16 array of, of electrodes on a chip. And they, ha they had to, uh, it's basically a chip that they wanted to put into a tissue, right on the surface of the tissue. So we used that same glue that we use for the fetal surgery to actually glue the, the electrode onto the tissue. So there's ap definitely applications. But what drives that? Clinicians. What are the problems? This is what, you know, I mean, we, we learn so much by talking to the physicians who or, or, and, and going to them or they come to us and say, hey, I have this problem. I have, I have this problem that I have no material for. That's, what, that's when things get really interesting. Thank you.